here. Right, um, Mark. Now the main uh, the main focus of tonight's meeting. A little bit of athleticism there. Mark Kennedy, Dr. Mark Kennedy, uh, is a lecturer from UCC School of Physics. He's going to talk to us about there and back again, a universe's tale. Um, I uh, I asked Mark about uh, six weeks ago if he would um, uh, talk to us. He said, "Well, I'm a, a galactic expert." I said, "What about cosmology?" And he said, well, I suppose I could make a fist of cosmology. I said, well, what I'm interested in mainly, I said, is what happened before the Big Bang. He said, well, I, I really haven't a clue about that. I said, well, you've got six weeks to find out. So, <laughs> Mark, yeah. take it away. Thank you. Um, before we get started, I should also probably apologize. I might say stuff that is totally incoherent over the next 40 minutes. Um, that is partially because I'm not a cosmologist, so I'm not an expert in this stuff. Um, but also, I did a full night of observing last night, so I'm currently running on three hours sleep over the last 37 hours. So everything's a little bit loopy. Um, the other thing is that my area of expertise is galactic astronomy. I mainly study objects and binary star systems that are within our own galaxy. But when I was offered the opportunity to talk about cosmology, I said I could probably dig out my undergraduate notes, freshen them up a little bit, and combine them with some of the things that colleagues that I've talked to over the last couple of years have, uh, have said around me, and I've kind of just learned it by osmosis. So why am I calling this there and back again. Well, mainly we're going to start on a journey of observationally, what do we know about the universe? What are we able to tell by pointing our telescopes at the night sky and measuring the distances to different objects? And once we have that set up, we'll then use that to step backwards and build up this bigger picture, perhaps, of where we think the universe may have come from. Um, I'm also happy to just take questions as we go, if there's any immediate obvious ones, but if you have a particularly long question, then maybe hang on to it until the end, but I'll be hanging around until we're kicked out of the building if anybody has any questions. All right? Okay, it would be really a shame of me to not start any talk about cosmology with recent pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope, which has been revolutionizing our view of how the universe formed in its early couple of uh, billion years. Um, and our goal is, when we see images like this, is to try and understand what each piece of information is telling us. So the most obvious feature, kind of this giant dot in the middle, um, it's actually a very large galaxy that's a significant distance away from us. But we can tell a lot by the color from it. The color here is that it's kind of white. And to us, a white galaxy means it's not particularly old. If it's not particularly old, it means it's not particularly far away. The most interesting objects that we can be looking for in images like this tend to be all these very, very small little red dots, like this one over here, because they are not small little stars, but they're rather very, very old galaxies at a very, very large, what we call redshift. We'll define redshift in a couple of, uh, in a couple of minutes. But the main takeaway from photos like this is that sometimes <coughs> the most boring little parts of them actually contain the most interesting information for us. OK, so cosmology, where do we start? An obvious place is to start with what we call the cosmological principle. This states. On the largest cosmic scales, the universe is both homogeneous and isotropic. So this is the starting point for understanding what, how our universe behaves at the largest scales. And it goes back basically to Isaac Newton. When Isaac Newton was trying to figure out how the laws of gravity worked, he started from an idea, well, why would gravity be special here on Earth? Should it not be the same everywhere. And that started to lead him to his idea of gravity must be a universal force, which then led to the development of his theory of gravity. 
And so if we want to start picking aside all the different terms in this cosmological principle, let's first of all start with homogeneous. It is the same everywhere. Now that is obviously not true. Uh, you can just look to the person beside you and realize that they are in fact a different person, which tells you that it can't be the same on everywhere. The important thing for us though, is that we're actually going to start talking about things on a very large scale. The other thing in isotropic is looks the same in every single direction. So no matter which direction you choose to look out into the universe, there shouldn't be a special or a preferred direction. At very large distances, everything should look approximately the same. Now again, on the very small scales, we know that that is not true. Again, this table is very different to this table that already breaks this cosmological principle. So the important keyword here is largest cosmic scales. And for this, we're going to start talking about scales that are larger than even the largest galaxies. So ignoring the Milky Way, ignoring Andromeda, on scales much, much larger than those, then everything within the universe should start to look both the same in any direction, but also the same at every point. And this is an important point for us because it allows us to kind of understand our space in the universe. If we ever look at a piece of observing data and it in some way suggests to you that you are living in a particularly special moment in time or in a special place, it violates the cosmological principle. Now, this is not a law. There are ways that you can violate it that are actually okay on the larger scales. But in general, it's worth asking yourself, okay, is this really breaking the cosmological principle or is there another way of interpreting the data that still allows us to hold this to be true? Now, one of the immediate consequences of the cosmological principle is what's known as Olber's paradox. Has anybody here heard of Olber's paradox before? Yeah. Okay. It's not why, if there's an infinite amount of stars, why isn't the sky bright all the time? Correct. So, the Olber's paradox basically goes like this. If it is true that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, so the same everywhere and the same in every direction, that should mean that absolutely every single eye, eye length or, or, or eyesight that you look up through the night sky, it should end at the surface of a star one way or another. And if that is true, then the entire night sky should be completely filled with starlight. But it's not. We know most of the night, night sky is dark. So our first question that we need to try and answer using the cosmological principle is how do we break Olger's, Olger's paradox? Why is the sky not lighting up exactly like this. And so the conclusion that helps to, to, uh, to, to solve Ober's paradox is that the universe is not static. If the universe were static, that is, it has a fixed volume or it is always expanding everywhere at the same rate and has been forever, then Ober's paradox should be true. But if for some reason the universe were to be expanding, it would, all, it would mean that there are places in the universe where there haven't been time, uh, enough time elapsed for a star to form yet. There's also another important thing for us, which is that we can only see the light from stars where enough time has passed for the light from them to reach us. So this comes into Einstein's theories of special relativity, basically that the speed of light is finite and fixed. It will always take a fixed amount of time for the light generated by a star to reach us here on Earth. So when you look up at a dark part of the night sky, it's not that there aren't any stars in that direction, it's just that the light from them hasn't had enough time to reach us yet. And so this is how we're able to use the cosmological principle to start understanding something like Olber's paradox. Okay, my next slide, I'm always a little bit worried about bringing it up. I'm really sorry if it scares you, um, but it's important to talk about it and that is Einstein's theory of general relativity. This is one of the most beautiful equations that has ever probably been arrived at. Um, and understanding it isn't actually that difficult. Solving it, another, another story altogether. But understanding it, it's not so bad. You can basically break it down into three small parts. The first one is what we call G mu nu. So these are just two Greek letters. They specify what we would call a tensor. Don't worry about it. The important thing is it tells you how your space-time behaves. The second element, all the way over here on the right, tells you how momentum and energy 
are going to be distributed within your space-time. And so if you want to understand how a particular space-time might work when you're using Einstein's general relativity, you plug in how it behaves over here, and then you solve for how the energy and momentum should be distributed. This term in the middle concerns the fate of absolutely everything within the known universe and is incredibly important for us as a species. But for the moment, we're going to ignore it. Um, the first part is, okay, let's say momentum and energy are distributed in your space-time like this. That is that there's nothing. There's no energy. There's no momentum. You just have a big, empty universe. Then you can just use this equation to tell you how your space-time should behave. And your space-time is what we would refer to as flat. Now, we refer to it as flat because we're much more used to working with 2D objects than we are with 3 or 4D objects. So you can imagine, basically, if you had a um, sheet of paper, then the sheet of paper, the fact that it is a flat surface and your ends do not connect to each other and there are no ups and downs in the middle, that is what a flat space-time kind of corresponds to. Now, you can plug other types of uh, energy and momentum into here if you wanted to. For example, if you just dropped a sphere of mass like the Earth or the Sun into this uh, side of the equation, you can solve for what the space-time looks like. And many of you may have seen these kind of effects where you have a wormhole around your mass. And that's all that Einstein's theory of general relativity is allowing us to do, is relate these key principles. Now, when he originally came up with, uh, with these equations, the reason that Einstein included this middle term, where this is the capital Greek letter lambda, is because his space-time was constantly expanding. And that caused him a lot of concern, because he didn't believe that the universe should be constantly expanding. And so he included this term here to stop his space-time from expanding. He included what he called a cosmological constant. He wasn't entirely sure what the value was for it or what might physically be behind it, but he needed to include it in order to understand observations as they were in the early part of the 1900s. Now, once it was uh, announced in his famous papers, Several different people came along and tried to solve this equation for various different types of space-times. The most important for at least our talk is going to be called the friedman lemaitre robertson walker solution, or FL or W. The important takeaways for it is that when you solve this equation here, you get two key parameters. The first one is you end up with a critical density, so this is the Greek letter rho, so C. It's related to some constants, so H, pi, and G, the gravitational constants, and this H we're going to encounter later on. And the second important thing that you end up with it is this capital omega, which we just define as being rho over rho critical, where rho is the current density of the observable universe. And so if you ever go and read any, par uh, any uh, articles about cosmology, there will be constant references to either the critical density or rho, which is just the ratio of these two densities. And what exact values these should take, we'll come across to later on. But it turns out that omega itself is pretty important for the universe, or at least for how we think it should behave, because it's got three distinct regimes. First of all, if omega is less than 1, then your universe is closed. That is, at some stage, your universe should stop expanding, contract, and crash in on itself. If it is equal to 1, you have a flat universe, the equivalent of that flat sheet of paper I was talking about earlier. And if it is greater than 1, you have an open universe, or a runaway universe, where the universe constantly expands, accelerates, expands, accelerates, and all the matter continues to get as far away from itself as fast as it possibly can. And so our goal when we try and study cosmology is to try and put some limit on what this value of omega is by determining, first of all, what should the critical density for our universe be, and also, what is the current density of the universe based on all of our observations? OK, in order to do this, we finally get to talk about what I'm a little bit of an expert in, which is observations. This is all stuff I can just put behind me now. And we're going to start talking about how we measure distances to different objects within the, um, within the Milky Way.
And there's kind of, or sorry, not within the Milky Way, within the universe, there's four different ways we do it. First of all, there's objects that are very, very close by to us, like the planets. For these, it's very easy for us to measure distances. For example, if we want to measure the distance is to Venus, we can simply point a giant radar at it, send a signal that will then bounce off the surface and come back to us. And as long as we just time how long it took for that signal to do the whole round trip, then we're able to very accurately determine the distance from us to the planet. So for example, the round trip to Venus is eight minutes, which means you should then be able to deduce that the distance to Venus is about four minutes away, or it takes like four minutes to travel from us to, Ven to, to Venus. However, this really only works for systems within the solar system, because as soon as you start moving outside the solar system, the time it takes for light to travel between objects obviously increases significantly. Our, our nearest neighbor is 4.2 light years away, which means if we want to measure it accurately using this technique, we would need to send a signal and then eight years later remember to turn on our receiver to catch it so that we could accurately measure the distance, which is not very feasible. And there are other issues with it as well, which is how would you even keep your light coherent over those distances? So how do we do it? If we want to step out outside of the solar system, how do we start measuring distances? Well, the second easiest way is to use a trick called parallax. Everyone's probably a little bit familiar with it. If you hold your finger out in front of you, move your head to side to side just a little bit, you can see that, oh, my finger's much closer to me than, for example, the wall over there. You can use that exact same trick for trying to measure the distance to stars by using the, the fact that the Earth is orbiting the sun every 12 months. So how we do this is we would normally, on a particular day, look at a star, project it onto what we would hope are some fixed background stars, record its position, and then six months later, you do the same trick. You now find that the star is projected into a different place on those background stars, and from that, you're able to very accurately deduce what the distance from the sun to that object is. So this is a trick that we called parallax, and um, it has notoriously been very, very difficult to do. Um, maybe in about 2009, the European Space Agency launched a new mission called Gaia, and Gaia's entire purpose is to measure the parallax for the closest billion stars within the Milky Way. So this type of trick only covers maybe about 20% of the volume of the Milky Way, and you can't get out any further than that using parallax. So how do you start stepping outside of the galaxy? How do we know, for example, how far Andromeda is away from us? Well, we're very, very fortunate in that something called Cepheid variables exist. So Cepheid variables are pulsating stars, and one of the beautiful facts about them is that their intrinsic luminosity, or their intrinsic brightness, is directly to related to what the period of their pulsations are. So for example, if I told you that a 10 watt light bulb has a period of every minute, that is every minute it flashes on, and a 20 watt light bulb has a period of every two minutes, then if I hold an object any distance away from you and you see it's pulsating every two minutes, you immediately know it's a 20 watt light bulb without having to actually measure what its luminosity is. And fortunately enough for us, there are enough Cepheid variables within the Milky Way that we can directly measure what their distances are from their parallax. And then, because we know what their period and luminosity relation is, that is their period and the brightness, we can then start using those to step out into the galaxy. So for example, these are how these, these, um, these, uh, this relation between the period and the luminosity for these objects looks. So if you have a period of three days, you know it's a luminosity of about a thousand times the luminosity of the sun, while if it has a period of a hundred days, then you know it's 30,000 times the luminosity of the sun. So this is a really useful instrument for us for stepping out to example for the Andromeda galaxy, because if we see that there are Cepheid variables in Andromeda with periods of 10 days, then we know directly what their luminosity is, or about 2,000 times the luminosity of the sun. If we then observe them with our telescopes, we know what the, how faint they are, and we can use that to calibrate our distance. So that gets us out to galaxies that are kind of close by to us, but not very far out to the universe, because these objects are not actually that bright. 30,000 times the luminosity of the sun isn't particularly bright. So how do we get on beyond these variables? For these, we tend to use what we call type 1a supernovae. 
So type 1a supernovae are binary star systems where we have a white dwarf at the center. So that is the burnt out shell of a star that has finished its life. And it is close enough to another star that it has distorted it and is consuming it through this giant disk of material. And as the white dwarf builds and builds mass, it approaches closer to what we call the Chandrasekhar limit. So this is the maximum mass that a white dwarf can have before it can no longer support itself uh, against gravity. And once it reaches this mass, it'll explode inwards and create an explosion that we call a type 1a supernova. <coughs> and the nice thing about this is we know exactly the mass that this happens for white dwarfs at. It happens at 1.39 solar masses. So when we see type 1a supernovae, we know, ah, that was a 1.39 solar mass white dwarf that is blown up. And fortunately for us, we've seen type 1 supernovae going off in galaxies where we've also detected Cepheid variables. So we've used the Cepheid variable to detect the distance of that galaxy. We now see a type 1a supernova go off. And that allows us to figure out exactly how bright a type 1a supernova is. And so now, if we see a type 1 supernova in a much further galaxy and we don't know the distance to it, well, it doesn't matter because we know how bright 1a supernovae are. So we can just compare their brightnesses and use that to figure out the distance of that galaxy. And so this concept of us constantly building up these different ways of measuring distances is what we refer to as the cosmic distance ladder. It allows us to continuously push out the boundaries to how far we're able to measure objects are away from the Earth. Now there's one more key part of, uh, of cosmology from an observational point of view that we need to talk, to, or talk about, and that is the concept of redshift. So everyone's probably very familiar with the Doppler effect. So if you're standing on the side of the street and a fire truck is driving towards you, it seems to be at a higher frequency. When it's right beside you, it's kind of at its natural frequency. And then when it's gone past you, it's at a lower frequency. And the exact same type of thing happens for the light from stars. They are affected by the same effect. And so if we look at a normal star and we take particular spectroscopy of it, so this tells us basically that there's a lot of hydrogen within the atmosphere of the star because this is the absorption line covered, uh, caused by uh, one of the, the transitions within the hydrogen atom. We know exactly the wavelength that this should occur at. It should occur at 6,563 angstroms. If that star is moving towards us, then we actually find that where that uh, absorption in our spectrum uh, occurs happens at a lower wavelength or higher frequency. And that's because the object's being blue shifted towards us. By it coming towards us, everything is moved towards a higher frequency. And a higher frequency is equivalent to a lower wavelength. So it's the exact same thing as happening with a fire truck, because if it's coming towards you, it's at a higher frequency. So objects that are moving towards us tend to be blue shifted. And then quite naturally, objects that are moving away from us tend to be red shifted. So these features go to longer wavelengths or lower frequencies. And they also happen to look more red as well because more of their light is being shifted out to these longer wavelengths. And so we tend to then in cosmology also talk about an object's redshift, where the redshift is simply the change in wavelength of one of these lines divided by the wavelength itself. So all you need to do is measure what the distance between these two troughs are and divide it by what the actual value of this here is and you can figure out an object's redshift. And so this obviously doesn't give you an idea of the distance, but it does give you an idea of the object's velocity. So how quickly it might be moving away to you or, or away from you or from, from you. Okay, so all of these tricks together now allowed us to build up the cosmic distance, distance ladder, where we can use uh, within the solar system this radar imaging for figuring out the distance of planets. For the nearest stars, we're able to use parallax from missions like Gaia to be able to figure out what their distances are. And fortunately, Cepheids lie within that group. We are then able to observe Cepheids in different galaxies that allow us to figure out the distances to those galaxies. And when type 1a supernovae go off in those galaxies, we can then use them to push out even further. All right, so that's kind of the introduction to how we do distances. So what does this actually tell us? Well, back in 1923, um, a 
bunch of uh, astronomers. The first one uh, is uh, an astronomer called Slipher, but who was then very quickly followed up by someone uh, everyone's probably a lot more familiar with, Edwin Hubble, started to uh, record what the redshift to nearest galaxies are, so that gives them an idea of what the velocity of those galaxies are. And they also started looking at what the distances to those galaxies should be as well. And they found a slightly unusual result. They found that the further a galaxy is away from us, the faster away from us it seems to be moving. And this is slightly problematic for us because it suggests that we're breaking the cosmological principle at some scale. Because if I'm standing here and everything is moving away from me, and the furthest things are moving fastest, then I would start getting worried a little bit that uh, maybe I'm in a special place within the universe. And so if I don't want that to be true, then the only thing I can conclude is that everything needs to be moving away from everything else all of the time, which is a little bit of a strange one to think about. So if we consider this cosmological principle again, everything needs to be the same everywhere, and it needs to be moving, it looks the same in every direction. So for us to not be in a unique position in the universe, this means all of space must always be equally expanding. So the analogy that people tend to use for this is if you considered a, uh, a loaf of bread that has a bunch of raisins that are inside of it. And before you put the loaf of bread in the oven, all of the raisins are relatively close to each other. And as the loaf of bread begins to expand, if you were standing on one of those raisins and measured the distance to all the raisins around you, you'd see all those raisins were moving away from you. But it would also be the same for anyone on any of the other raisins. And it's not that they're actually moving away from each other, it's that the space that is in between those raisins is constantly growing and growing and growing. So this was an incredibly important result in beginning to understand how the universe might be behaving on the largest scales. It seems to suggest to us that space itself is constantly expanding and pushing objects away from each other. And so this is the original figure from um, Hubble's paper that shows what is now known as Hubble's Law, where he plots the distance to galaxies versus their measured velocity away from each other. And if you maybe squint really hard from the back of the room, you can convince yourself that this is a straight line. Um, but it gives you this nice relationship here that the velocity of an object should be equal to some constant h naught times the distance of the object. This is really useful for us because now, for the very furthest galaxies within the, the, the universe, we no longer need to wait for a type 1a supernova to explode in them to figure out the distance. All we need to do is measure the redshift, which gives us a hand of the velocity, and we know what the distance to them is, which is really, really a useful result. The other consequence of this, um, the, this, this idea now that the universe is constantly <coughs> expanding is that it meant that a long time before that, the universe was probably an awful lot smaller. It was probably compacted down into a point of infinite mass and density. Now, at the time, there was two conflicting schools of thought on this. So that, that idea that everything was in on top of each other, we now refer to as the Big Bang Theory. And there was another school of thought that was uh, developed in the United Kingdom, which was focused on what they called the um, uh, static universe, where the universe was constantly rearranging itself to keep everything at a normal scale while still expanding. And we now know that the static universe probably not true. I would need to include probably with everything I say, unfortunately. Um, okay, so there's a couple of more consequences to this, which is mainly if we go back to Einstein's field equation for general relativity. Well, he initially included this cosmological constant because he didn't want his universe to be constantly expanding. He was really worried about it. And so he included this constant to try and keep the universe together. But now that we have this observation result that actually, in fact, the universe is constantly expanding, you just set that lambda equal to zero, and throw it away. You don't need to worry about it anymore. And so once Hubble's law was published in about the 1930s, this completely disappeared from, um, from discussions in cosmology. And, and as I was saying earlier, we now have a useful tool for being able to measure uh, the distance through objects just by looking at what their redshifts should be. Um, okay, so the next thing we can start thinking about is if the universe was a long time ago a very small, infinitely hot, infinitely dense 
um, uh, medium, then that allows us to make a prediction for what would have happened as the universe started to rapidly expand. And that is that it should have cooled quite quickly. So if we now consider what we think should have been happening in the earliest parts of the universe, we should have had a sea of protons, electrons, and photons that were constantly flying around each other. And any time an electron bumped into a proton and wanted to form together to create a hydrogen atom, your photons had enough energy that they could immediately break it. And so you weren't able to form any elements at all within this very early universe, what we would now call a basically cosmic soup. But as the universe begins to expand, as we were saying earlier, uh, as, as space expands, um, the distance or the wavelength of these photons also tends to increase, that is their frequency decreases. And if a photon tends to get longer, then it also loses energy. Which means at some stage, when the universe was appropriately large, the temperature would now have dropped that the photons could no longer break apart electrons and protons when they came together anymore. And we would have started forming the very first hydrogen atoms. And at this point, all of these photons basically get frozen out from interacting with anything else in the universe. They just start wandering off, never to interact with anything again. So this was a key prediction of the Big Bang Theory, is that we should be able to, in principle, be able to see these photons still in the universe today, albeit at a very, very long wavelength or a very, very low frequency, because they've had a very long time to be stretched out. Now you probably know where this is all going, because uh, people have probably heard of the cosmic microwave background before, but there's a lot of beautiful images that come out from it. So this is from the Planck telescope, which was sent on a mission to hunt down this radiation and really pinpoint what it looks like throughout the night sky. And this is one of its raw images. You can see there's a lovely, lovely structure here with the Milky Way where you see a lot of emission along the, the Milky Way's plane and then all these beautiful arcs coming up and out of it and down at the bottom. If you remove the emission from the Milky Way so that you're now just looking at what radiation is in the background of the universe, you get a really beautiful map that looks like this, which to our eyes looks kind of noisy, but in reality, the variations between the red part of, a, uh, uh, of the plot here and the blue part of the plot here are about one in a million. So this object here is smooth to one part in one million, which is really useful for us because it means that initially, when the universe did freeze out what we now call the cosmic microwave background, the universe was relatively isotropic, but there were tiny little bits where things were just a little bit colder here and maybe a little bit warmer here. And these very small little fluctuations as the universe would have expanded more and more rapidly are what end up cascading into where matter accumulates and you start to deform your very first stars, your very first galaxies. And as you develop more and more galaxies, they all start coming together more and more rapidly. There's a couple of more interesting results that come out from this telescope. Uh, the main one here is you don't really need to worry too much, mainly just focus on how beautiful the fit here, because fitting this type of polynomial to all these data points is really, really hard. Uh, but the really nice thing about it is that these peaks here represent all of the differences in the red areas and the blue areas of this map. And the scales on which they vary, so this scales here with about maybe one degree, and this is about 0.2 degrees, so that tells you how far away points have to be before they're being considered correlated, it tells us an awful lot about the distribution of matter within the universe in its early times. And this actually turns out to be a key piece of evidence for what we now call dark matter. All right, dark matter, whole different kettle of fish. So there are a couple of observational uh, uh, results for what we now consider to be dark matter. First of all, it was, uh, uh, its existence was hinted at the ob by observations of galaxies. So if we recall the lovely image we saw of Andromeda when we were being told about what's in the night sky tonight, um, if you just naively think about what might happen if all of the mass of Andromeda is concentrated in the center, say in some supermassive black hole, then the stars that are orbiting closest to that supermassive black hole should be orbiting the fastest, while all of the stars on the very outskirts of the galaxy should be moving incredibly slow. 
And this is what people thought should be happening whenever you look at how the velocities of stars around galaxies are behaving. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out that's not how it goes. Um, the opposite was observed. Turns out that the stars on the furthest outer parts of the galaxies were orbiting the fastest. And if our theories of gravity are correct, I don't think they are, um, then that means that there's an awful lot of matter that is outside of galaxies, or at least outside of their cores, that we are unable to detect using electromagnetic radiation. And so this is why we refer to these, uh, this, uh, this substance as dark, because it doesn't uh, interact with radiation, so it doesn't interact with any sort of light, which makes it very hard for us to see. Um, and also, it doesn't interact with other types of matter or normal matter. So if a dark matter particle and a normal matter particle came close to each other, they wouldn't bounce off of each other. The only thing that would happen is that they would affect each other gravitationally. And at least that's one of our key observables that we know about dark matter at the moment. Um, everything else? There's a lot of theories for what it could be, but um, there's no one, this is what dark matter candidate is just yet. Um, the nice thing about all those data that we had from the Planck telescope, though, is that it tells us that the ratio of normal matter to dark matter inside of the universe, which you get by basically comparing this peak to these two peaks is give or take, I think it's about 24 to 3. So 24 times as much dark matter as there is regular matter, which is kind of mad that the universe is filled with this matter that we're not able to see. We can only detect its effect gravitationally. And there are a couple of other pieces of evidence that we have for it that I can talk to people about if they'd, if they'd like afterwards. Um, okay. So moving back now to, uh, to this idea of um, the cosmic distance ladder, we now step forward from about the 70s or 80s, which is when the cosmic microwave background was initially discovered, to the 1990s, when a team of astronomers decided to try and figure out what the distance and velocities to the very furthest away galaxies that they could observe were. Um, by looking for 1A supernovae. And this was all enabled by the beautiful Hubble Space Telescope, which back in the 90s revolutionized our view of astronomy, much how JWST is doing it these days. Um, and by looking, for example, these supernovas that you'd look on them on one night, and then two weeks later, you'd look and you'd see this new detection here, they were able to measure very accurately what the velocities of the very highest redshift galaxies are. Now, this galaxy here, uh, where they see this redshift, uh, or this, this supernova, apologies, has a redshift of give or take 1.5. And I'll put that into context a little bit later, but it's useful to know that this lies at a redshift of 1.5. Prior to this, the best we were doing for observing objects was maybe a redshift about 0.5. So Hubble was able to put us out three times further than we were able to do without it. One of the interesting things that they started to find when they started looking at supernovae in the most furthest parts of the universe is that they were under luminous to what we thought they would be. That is, they appeared fainter when we tried to calibrate them to uh, the supernova that we knew were occurring within the local universe. And that actually tells us that, well, you know, a supernova is a supernova. So that must mean that those galaxies are actually much further away than I thought they were in order for them to be fainter than they should be. And this now allows us to tie together, first of all, um, the distance to objects through Cepheids, then Cepheids to type 1a supernovae, and now type 1a supernovae all the way out to high redshift. And the key result from this paper is that at very high redshifts, you no longer follow this nice linear trend. And the only way that can be um, described is not if everything is moving away from each other, but also if that is happening at an accelerating rate. So the universe, the universe no longer now is just expanding at a constant rate, but that is accelerating away from you. And this observation that at the very highest redshift, objects are further than what we think they should be, led for astronomers to develop an idea of what we now have to call dark energy. So alongside dark matter, we don't know a whole lot about it because we can't observe it. It doesn't really interact with anything, but we know that it has to be there because we can see its effects on the very, very largest scales. 
And the interesting thing about having to invoke dark energy in order to explain this accelerating expansion of the universe is if you go back to Einstein's equations for general relativity, look what comes back. You have to start including a cosmological constant all over again. It's fascinating because if you look back at comments from Einstein when he was initially developing this theory, um, he initially thought that including it was what he called his greatest blunder. He thought it was a real mistake including it. And when he was able to get rid of it by um, the, the Hubble law, he was absolutely thrilled. Uh, and then by the 1990s, what was his greatest blunder actually became probably the most important ingredient in the universe, which is kind of fascinating. Um, so if we then make a fit to how these objects are moving away from us at the very highest redshift, we find that this critical omega that we were talking about in the FL or W uh, solution to Einstein's field equation, um, it has to count for maybe about 70% of the total density of the universe, which is kind of mad. So we're about 5%, all of us, everything that you can see out there in the universe. 25% of it is dark matter that we know is there gravitationally, but we can't detect in other ways. And then 70% of it is, well, I don't know. It's all kind of, kind of a little bit weird. Um, but this allows us to start considering how the universe should have come into formation. So there's a lot of discussion at the moment in the scientific community about trying to nail down what the ratio of omega matter, so that is the contribution to that omega parameter by all of matter, both dark and normal matter, versus what contribution is coming from what we now call dark energy. And we have different ways that we're able to estimate what those different ratios are. So the one that we've mainly been talking about is this supernovae experiment here, which gives you these constraints on the parameter. The cosmic microwave background, so that initial symbol from when all the photons were frozen out from the universe, gives you separate constraints on it. And there's also a way of looking for the constraints of what omega matter should be based on how clusters of galaxies are behaving, because that gives you an idea of how much dark matter is around the visible light you're able to see coming off of these clusters. And all of these things together, when we sum them up, we find that omega is 0.9997 plus or minus 0 0.00, I think it's one, give or take. So it is just about consistent with being equal to one. So as far as we can tell, these observational constraints tell us that our universe is flat. It's a little bit contrived if you think about the fact that we've had to make up 70% of it in order to get there. But the current race now is to try and continue hammering down on those measurements of what the ratio of omega lambda to omega matter will be so that we can tell, do we lie on the open side of the universe line here? Do we lie on the closed side of the universe line? Or are we literally right on the cusp of it? And there's a couple of interesting cosmological implications for, for lying on the cusp that I can chat to people over tea if they'd like. OK, so this now allows us well, that was us there, now for the back again part, which we can kind of go through a little bit quicker. This allows us to build up a picture for how the universe should have evolved if we believe in the Big Bang. So the initial Big Bang, no idea. We, we really have no clue what may have caused it or what may have came beforehand. What we do think is that immediately after the Big Bang, there is a period of what we call rapid inflation, where the universe grew exponentially inside. Um, there are suggestions that we can look for this in the cosmic microwave background. So all of those little anisotropies between the red and the blue parts, if they create particular patterns, that might actually be indicative of this rapid period of inflation happening. We then get what we refer to as recombination, which is a really silly name, but astronomers are really good at making up silly names. Uh, recombination is when hydrogen was able to form within the universe, so protons and electrons were able to form, and the cosmic microwave background got frozen out. Uh, why it's called recombination and not combination, I have no idea. Uh, we then enter what we call the dark ages, where basically there's no light. We're sitting around, we're waiting for stars to form, because all that's hanging around in the galaxy is hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and a little bit of lithium, and this cosmic microwave bouncing around, and a whole lot of dark matter that is only influencing things gravitationally. 
Then, after, give or take, 200 million years, finally all the hydrogen atoms get together to form the very first stars. And these first stars are kind of a holy grail for astronomers. We call them POP3 stars or population 3 stars. Again, in our very silly naming convention, the stars that exist right now we call population 1. The stars that existed in the second phase of the universe we call population 2. And the stars that existed first we call population 3, because we like to have things go the wrong way around. Um, but these population 3 stars should have been absolutely massive. They should have been thousands to if not hundreds of thousands the mass of our sun. And that is because there's no metals yet to pollute them. And if you only have hydrogen forming a star, you're able to form much, much larger stars than we can do in our metal polluted universe today. So you form the first stars, they very quickly evolve because the larger a star is, the quicker it goes through its evolution. Once it's passed through its first phase of evolution, it goes through a supernova and starts producing metals and influencing the environment. And after that, we start forming the very first clusters of galaxies and superclusters. And then we can just follow this all forward. If anybody was here for Michael Tremel's talk last December, basically his work starts from here onwards, where you've been able to form your initial seed galaxies and you're then just looking at how everything starts following these filaments uh, which were probably frozen into place by the cosmic microwave background. So just by these observations of supernova in very high redshift galaxies and of this frozen out light from these initial 300,000 years after the Big Bang, we're able to develop a pretty good picture for how we think the universe should have, uh, should have been going, at least from here. The uh, main task for uh, uh, observational astronomers at the moment is to probe further into this period of time here. What was going on just when the very first stars were formed and how did that influence galaxy formation and black hole formation? Unfortunately, this is basically like a cosmic censorship. It's very hard for us to be able to probe beyond back the cosmic microwave background because before then all of the information that would have been contained in the universe constantly washed away by interactions between these free-flowing photons, electrons, and protons. So where are we going with this in the future? Let's return to that very first image that I showed you of the James Webb Space Telescope and these high redshift galaxies. As I said, the most interesting objects in that are the smallest, reddest objects. We know they're red now because they're at incredibly high redshifts, so all of their light is being forced out into these really long wavelengths. And this commensal image from James Webb Space Telescope, one of the first ones, you know, it's got another five years to go at least as it's producing more and more science results, but one of its very first ones was to start de detecting galaxies, one of which is likely 13.1 billion years old, which is just about on the cusp of when we believe galaxies should have been able to start forming. Uh, and I think the redshift of this, if you calculate it outwards, it's at about a redshift of 11. So the Hubble Space Telescope was able to get us out to a redshift of 1.5, maybe out to a redshift of 2 in its later years. JWST, in its first year of observations, straight out to 11, no bother. So goodness only knows what we're going to see over the next couple of years as we take longer and longer and deeper exposures with JWST and we really push the boundaries back for where we're able to detect light coming from the very first galaxies. Um, but it's not just current missions that are exciting. There are also a couple of missions being led by the European Space Agency and by NASA, which are built directly to probe both dark energy and dark matter within the universe. So the two I've kind of chosen to highlight here are Euclid. So Euclid launched last year and is going to be surveying how dark matter is uh, distributed around galaxy clusters within the relatively high redshift universe. And then this is the proposed um, Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which should be launching sometime in about 2027, 2028, whose entire mission is based around three things. It's first of all going to start looking for exoplanets within the local Milky Way. It's going to start looking for wandering black holes through microlensing events. And then its third pillar that it's trying to, to solve is what the dark energy content of the universe is by giving us better constraints on what that Omega Lambda is. Um, so that brings me up to about 48 minutes there. So I'm happy to leave it there. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to try and answer them.
That's brilliant, Mark, and thanks for leaving a lot of time for questions, which I'm sure there will be. Who's going to come first? John. I feel see how the, um, the when you go back to the sentence, you've got the procuring obviously, tells you the size of it, size of it tells you the numerosity of it, and then suddenly we know how far away it is. I haven't made that yet. How do we go from the luminosity to distance? Okay, so if I hold up a 10 watt light bulb here, and you take a photograph of it with a CCD, and you measure it to be 0.1 watts, then you can use that to figure out what the distance is between them, right? Because you know intrinsically you've got 10 watts here, you're receiving 0.1 watts over there, that means all 10 watts has to be distributed in a uniform sphere, and so that allows you to calculate what the distance is. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, okay. Oh. I've heard a lot of astrologists to say that uh, dark matter is badly named. It should be actually called clear matter. Yeah. Light doesn't interact with it. Yeah, it's, 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 okay, so clear matter, I guess, would suggest that light or, or radiation is able to just pass through it. Dark matter also kind of works as well, just because um, it also doesn't emit light. Right? One of our concerns is you could have clear matter that also itself is able to emit it because it has a temperature, right? One of the, so, so for example, the sun, the sun has a temperature of 5,800 Kelvin, and because of that, it gives off very characteristic radiation. Uh, in principle, dark matter can have a temperature to it, um, and it just doesn't give off any radiation. Uh, now, one bit that I may have skipped over a little bit, which is... Uh, yes, here is that often when you're talking to a cosmologist, they'll tell you that they're following lambda CDM. So lambda CDM is lambda stands for the fact that they're accounting for dark energy. And then CDM means they're assuming that dark matter is cold dark matter. That is, it is too cold to really be contributing any significant amount of radiation to it. But there are alternative forms of dark matter that do allow it to have a temperature, but not to emit light. So I, I suspect dark matter might be a little bit more useful in that respect, but you're right, clear would also work in understanding that radiation just kind of passes through it without even seeing it. Thanks. No worries. There's a question right at the back, and then I'm going to come in with one of my own. Thank you, Dr. Uh, the question that I was supposed to face, um, at the beginning, at the big bang point, all the mass and energy of the universe is concentrated in one point. How come that's not that isn't a singularity? <laughs> I mean, it, it could have been. I, I can't say that it's not. There's, if you consider the universe, there's kind of two types of universes that we talk about. There's the observable universe, which is what we are able to see because enough time has elapsed for light to be able to get us. But then there is also the, um, oh, what do they call it? Oh, I can't remember the exact name for it. But there is a, a finite volume that we will ever be able to see for the universe because events from, those, from stars outside of it will never have long enough to reach us because the universe continues to expand, continues to stretch out the photons of light from it. And so this basically develops what we would call an event horizon on the outside of the universe that we're inside of in. So most certainly, you know, you could then say that we do live inside of a singularity and then that lines up with the Big Bang starting off at a point of infinite mass and density. Um, so I wouldn't be against calling it a singularity, but realistically detecting what exactly it would be is, is currently, I don't think anyone even has a good idea of how we would detect it. Now, Mark, I'm going to come in with a question of my own now, and I'm going to embarrass myself because when I've asked my question, you'll see there's, there's all big chunks of your talk I didn't understand. <laughs> okay, first, that's first my bad, first of all, sorry. <laughs> first of all, that this open, closed, and flat. Now, you came to the conclusion, actually, you were talking about this slide here, you came to the conclusion that the universe is almost flat. Am I right? Yes. So the question about whether it will continue to expand forever or whether it will contract, eventually collapse on itself, that remains open, am I right? Um, not quite. If we're at a flat universe, which we think we are, it's within the areas that we're in a flat universe, 
the universe will continue to expand at a very slowly accelerating rate. But it won't reach this what we call a runaway universe where everything moves apart exponentially fast. So you can consider perhaps this sheet of paper is a bad metaphor for the entire universe. Um, a closed universe should look something like this. You have both ends wrapped up on top of each other. An open universe would look like a parabolic surface like this. A flat universe would be perfectly flat like this. And for us, we think at the moment that we're maybe just, just slightly on this side, just slightly bent open. If we were on the less than one end side of this, our universe would look like this. And as the universe gets older and older, the sides will come crashing together. Yeah, see, my it, is, it's very hard to visualize in a 2D space, unfortunately. My, my problem is that I haven't really gained a lot of insight back. <laughs> you're, you're, ab you're absolutely correct. I mean, this is the, this is the problem. Really in the past two minutes. This is the problem with using something like, like flat for a two dimensional universe. It's, it's a very hard concept to try and describe without having basically living in a fourth dimension and being able to see it that way. Okay, well, here's the other question which maybe exposes my uh, lack of grasp of what we were talking about, and that is that before you came onto this slide, you were. You, you, uh, um, telling us how uh, observations tell us that the furthest away galaxies are, are in fact racing away from us at an ever increasing rate. A, a slightly increasing rate. A slightly it's increasing. not exponentially increasing, which oh, is yes. what would be the hallmark of a completely open universe. So if this were, uh, actually this is probably a better plot of it, and I'll pull up the marker here. Um, if these points were up here, these ones shifted up here, you would require an omega lambda much, much larger than 0.8 in order to reach them, and you would hit an exponentially increasing growth as you move out to higher redshift. But they're only slightly deviating from what a straight line fit here is for us, which is why it's only slightly increasing, and you get an omega is equal to one. These, this dashed line here is what you get if you assume that everything in the universe is just matter and there's no dark energy inside of it. So that would be what Einstein was considering to be a, a closed universe where everything is going to eventually squeeze back in on itself. That is what you would get if you follow this dashed line up here. So this addition of dark energy just allows you to fit these large data points and has the consequence of mean that this universe is just slightly flat. So the universe will continue to expand? Uh, at, at the moment, our observational results say yes. Now, you, didn't There's actually, you didn't actually use the expression heat death, but is that where the heat death comes in? Yes. Yeah, right. Yes, it okay. does. Mm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if, the, if the universe is an isolated thermodynamic system, then there's nowhere for the energy content of the universe to go, which means that this combination of dark matter, matter, and uh, dark energy should be fixed, always. There are questions asked by people about whether or not the universe is an isolated thermodynamic system. That is, could it be part of a larger system of what people would call multiverses? Yes, I'm sponsored by Marvel to say that, sorry. Um, where all of your, your universes are allowed to exchange energy with each other. And if you get to a situation where universes can start exchanging energy, then you can start changing what these ratios could be. And if you start changing what these ratios could be, then you end up changing what the final fate of the universe could be, which is kind of wild and the stuff from science fiction, literally. Um, so for the moment, we treat the universe as isolated. We treat it that the energy content is fixed. There's no energy leaking out from the side of the universe. We treat the universe as being flat. Whether all of that is going to be true is something that remains to be answered. Right, now, sorry for abusing my position by <laughs> asking so many questions. Any more questions? Yeah, I have one more. Um, um, Mark, sorry, if I just jump in because it's on the, the same point. Just stay with the flat universe for a moment. Surely that doesn't fit with our practical observations. Because if we take, as we have the James West, our own telescope, mm -hmm. and we point them in any direction 360 degrees, we will see billions and billions of galaxies, billions and billions of galaxies. But that doesn't fit with the flat universe. And with the flat universe, we should see them on that day, but we shouldn't see them up there or up there. This is where my analogy of a 2D 
paper goes out the window. Um, a, a flat universe does not mean that everything is confined to a single two-dimensional plane. Uh, a flat universe in this regard would mean that everything is confined to a single uh, flat three-dimensional plane, which is why it's so hard to understand. Yeah, it's, yes. Yeah, it, it's a very difficult concept to, 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 uh, to try and lecture about, which is, which is why I'm, I'm not a cosmologist, right? I, I struggle with all of these things as well. Um, but at least our cosmological principle is correct, right? As you said, you look everywhere, you see galaxies, on the largest scales, they all seem to be the same. So that at least tells us that our cosmological uh, principle tends to be true. The cosmological principle, then if we want to make a sense of these observations, means that that universe needs to be flat for whatever flat needs. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give a more interesting or better answer than that. Now, but before I take the next question, I've got to say that I can tell that not everyone who wants to ask you a question will have time, because there will only be there'll only be time for three or four more questions. But can I have a glimpse, please, of who wants to ask a question? Just, just one question. Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll take you next part, but before you do, yeah. I just need to see who else wants to talk. John, yeah, who else? James, Colin, anyone else? Okay, Pat. Yeah, um, just need to go over to the um, dark matter. He's out there. Now, if I'm out there, could it be here? Could it be here? That's, that's, I, that's a very good question. Concentrations of where we think dark matter should be within galaxies is uh, <coughs> slightly well constrained. So if you ever talk to somebody who works on galaxy formation or evolution, they talk about dark matter halos, which is basically a, a shell of material around the galaxy where all of your dark matter is populated and exists. And yes, it should be running through the veins of your galaxy as well, albeit at a much smaller um, uh, uh, amount, but the majority of it should be concentrated very far out from your galaxies in these huge, what we call dark matter halos. Uh, and we know this because when we look at galaxies, like for, um, let me see if I can very quickly pull up a very useful slide. Um, sorry, this is going to delay us even asking even more questions, but I'll hang around to be sure that everyone gets a chance. Uh, where is the mouse? Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Uh, okay. So if we follow this um, link, this is an image of the Andromeda galaxy that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope between the years of 2000 and 10 in 2015, I think. The beautiful thing about this, uh, this image is that you can zoom in, and 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 you can, unfortunately for some poor PhD student, count up every single star. <laughs> and from this, you can get an approximate idea for how much mass should be in Andromeda. And because we know how these stars within the center of Andromeda are orbiting, we're able to then compare how much mass can we see versus how much mass we think should be there based on orbits of, of objects. And it tends to be that a lot of the mass that we see towards the center of these galaxies tends to be all the mass that there is. It's only when we really start moving out towards the outer parts of these galaxies that we start to start missing mass. Now, I can already preempt, perhaps people are looking at this and be like, aha, look, there's your dark matter. Uh, no, these are, these are just dust clouds and dust veins within Andromeda that are blocking light from us. Uh, yeah, so yes, that's, that's how we're able to get a rough idea of where dark matter might be concentrated in different galaxies. John? Yeah, when you talk about the universe uh, expanding, the other side is huge. Oh, <laughs> 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 you're talking about the fourth new part of the universe that is infinite, and I was just wondering, is it, could it be just that it's some sort of void where stars haven't sort of been developed yet? So un unfortunately, for, was, uh, the reason that it couldn't be, because if it were normal space where just matter hasn't reached yet, it would still have a dark energy content, and you'd need to be accounting for it when you're basically doing your budgeting for what omega should be throughout the universe. 
The problem for us, unfortunately, is you know we're 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 four dimensional beings, right? We live in the three dimensional world, but we also experience the fourth dimension of time. But trying to conceptualize what may lie beyond that, we need to rely on things that we see within the universe in order to explain it, right? We think of the universe having to expand into space, so we think of blowing up a balloon and expanding into the the room, right? Unfortunately, it it it, it probably isn't like that. But there's also no way that we can really tell because we have no way of seeing outside of the universe. There's this this limit on how far we can see back because of this finite amount of time that it takes for photons to reach us here on Earth. Um, but unfortunately, it is likely not to be like space or time as we know it outside of the universe, whatever it is expanding into. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh... I've only got time for one more question, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm going to thank James, but before I do, uh, can I apologise to those of you who are disappointed you haven't been able to ask you a question, but in a few minutes after this last question and answer, I'll be closing the meeting. I've got a few more things to say, but um, in, in a few minutes I'll be closing the formal meeting. We have tea down here in Biscuits. You can come down and you can have a chat to Mark and you'll see that when you actually chat to him, it's not the case that he's just been whitewashing his house. He, he, has, a, he, has, actually, he has actually wearing a Galaxy T-shirt. <laughs> and you'll see that with your own eyes. Now, it's grown fractionally since we've been talking. <laughs> James. <laughs> now, if we take um, Einstein's equation on the equivalence of mass and energy e equals mc squared, if you apply that to dark energy, does it mean that dark matter is equivalent to dark energy only? So uh, Einstein's, Einstein's equation of E is equal to mc squared is not actually the whole equation. There's additional terms in there that we don't talk about, um, where it's uh, E squared is equal to m squared c squared plus c squared p of the fourth. There's this momentum term at the end that is normally thrown out the window. You only ever need to worry about it when things are moving at relativistic speeds. So when things are moving slowly, forget about that last term, it's just E is equal to mc squared. When things are moving relativistically, you find that energy is not built up in the mass of an object, but is built up in the momentum. So it's a little bit tricky to use the E is equal to mc squared argument to talk about this. But you are right that when Einstein was developing special relativity, which is where that equation comes from, the fact that he couldn't get a theory of gravity that worked with the, the speed of light is what led him to have to develop his Einstein field equation. And the field equation that that solution, E squared is equal to M squared, C squared, blah, 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 uh, is one of the very special solutions to it if you assume a particular distribution of mass and space in your space time. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't, it doesn't work for explaining dark energy or matter for us. They don't seem to be related to each other, at least as best as we can tell. No worries. Now, my apologies to Colin and one or two other people I know want to ask a question, but I'm afraid we do have to close it there. So I'm, I'm, I'm now going to thank Mark on your behalf. I'll have a few closing announcements to make, and then it's tea and coffee time. So, Mark, uh, you, you've taken us an amazing canter in about 40 minutes through 14 billion years and another 40 billion years in the future. And I salute you for not shying away from showing us some very abstruse equations which I didn't really understand. <laughs> so I have here something which on behalf of Corporate Astronomy Club I would like to offer you as a small token of our thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. For the Just a few things to say to you. Um.